great to be in church. We can't stress it enough. And once again, I'm going to belabor this point. This is not how we would wish to be meeting. It feels a little bit distant at times, but we're going to get there soon, hopefully, rather than later. Just keep praying, keep praying, and keep pressing on. Uh, we can't wait to see your faces and be able to hug and shake hands and be normal again. Um, Open up your Bible to the book of John. As we read earlier in our scripture reading, there is a charge that we're going to be speaking on the, for the rest of the day. And this charge is basically to the church, to those who have considered themselves Christian, to those who believe they are Christian, to those who say they are Christian or in a more uh, simple term, to those who have placed their faith on the person and work of Jesus Christ. There is a specific charge. There is a, a, a job description for those who believe in the person and work of Jesus Christ. For all of you who are employed, for all of you who go to work every day, you understand that your job description or your job role is very important because if you don't do what you're told or you don't do what your job description entails, then you chances are you'll get fired, chances are you won't get paid, chances are you'll get uh, yelled at or your boss will come down hard. Because you don't know your job description or because you're not fulfilling the functions of your job role. So what I want to really drive and, and bring forth, church, as we read through John chapter 5, is call you to the attention of your job description, your primary role as a believer, as a person, once more, who has submitted themselves to the authority of Jesus Christ. And the Bible calls this witness. Uh, there's a, a Greek word that, that sounds similar to martyrdom in the sense of a testimony. A, a way to testify or witness about someone or something. And in the biblical terms, to witness to truth. So as we dissect these verses to come, and I'll probably only get through the first couple of verses in, in John chapter 5, verses 30 and on. Uh, there is this theme of witness. And once again, it's a charge for the church. So if, if you've been in church for a while and you forgot your job role and your job description and your mission, um, the pastor's not yelling at you. This is not me like you know, lashing you and giving you uh, five points off or, or deducting from your pay. I, I can't do that. Uh, but this is the word of God calling you and charging you. I don't know if you've witnessed uh, marriage ceremonies, and there is a charge at a marriage ceremony. How many remember uh, what it was to stand before a congregation similar to this and say, I do? And the pastor usually charges the, the male and the female in, 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 the, in these ceremonies, and it gives them a charge. You are to be faithful to your husband. You are to be faithful to your wife. There is a charge, and you must obey that charge, especially because it's within Scripture. So the courtroom theme of John chapter 5, verse 30 and on, has been uh, a, a, a constant theme that has been occurring since chapter 1 of John. We see this word witness appear several times, and it's from the beginning of the gospel. And the identity of Jesus is what's on trial here. We saw this earlier in chapter 5 as well as in chapter 1. It is the identity of Jesus that is under fire. Who, is, who he is and what he says at this point has become very problematic. This goes back to the question I've been asking you all along to, to ask yourselves on a consistent daily basis. What do you do with the person of Jesus? Who is Jesus? What, do I, what am I supposed to do with a person that claims that he is the savior of the world. Is he the son of God? Is he your savior? Can he forgive sin? Can he forgive your sin? Are his words alone the means to eternal salvation or eternal life? 
And if there is such a thing as heaven, is he the only means to get there or the only way to get there? All these questions are implicit in the, in, in the works and words of Jesus up until this point. So in chapter 5, he is on trial for blasphemy. Why? Because earlier in the chapter we read that he healed on the Sabbath and that he compared himself to God. And in a sense, he said he was God. And that's obvious blasphemy for the Jewish person who is listening to a man compare himself to God and give himself the same authority as God. To the, the Jewish person, Yahweh, there is none like Yahweh. There is none like God of the Old Testament. And for someone to say, I am God, that doesn't fly. So this identity is on trial here. And Jesus seeks to clear this up once more by calling four witnesses to the stand. Now, if you've been a, wit a witness or if you've watched Netflix or any type of courtroom uh, movie or, or show, Law and Order, or whatever it may be, you'll know that the lawyers or the attorneys constantly call credible witnesses to the stand to testify about truth. And so Jesus, in this sense, calls four credible witnesses to the stand. Now you ask yourself, why would the Son of Man need to do something like this? This is God. This is Jesus Christ. He, there's no reason for him to, to submit himself under fire. Well, there is for his purpose. And we'll read what his purpose is as we go forth. But four of the credible witnesses that he calls to the stand is first and foremost, if you're going to write notes, the first witness that he calls to the stand is God the Father. The second witness, as we will read today, is John the Baptist, which is the human character or human quality of a of a witness. The third witness he will call to the stand in these verses is his own miraculous works. And the fourth witness he will call to the stand is the scriptures, which will entail our firm foundation and what we base our faith on. So these are the four witnesses that will be testifying about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Friends and church, once more, our job description primarily rests on our testimony, on our verbal testimony about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Here we have four credible witnesses focusing and bringing the attention on Jesus Christ and clarifying who and what he does. There is no ambiguity here. There isn't any room for negotiation. There isn't any room to kind of say, well, I think, well, I kind of figure, or I feel that Jesus, or he should. There is none of that within these four witnesses because they all claim the same and they have a firm authority. Especially when we consider his first witness, which is his own father. So this is why Jesus transitions over to this next section with these two verses. Firstly, as one would expect from any judge in a courtroom to judge justly, Jesus' ju Jesus' judgment is just. It is so because it comes by the will of the one who sent him, his father. And in second place, in verse 31, it is a legal sense of true as evidence in court. Supporting witnesses are needed to validate the testimony. So read once more verse 30 and 31. Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. There he is, calling the Father to witness. If I alone, in verse 31, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. What Jesus is doing here is calling credible witnesses that can prove Jesus is the sent one from God for the purposes of salvation and eternal life in a sinful world. In presenting these witnesses, Jesus is in compliance with the Old Testament law. See, the Old Testament law and the Jewish people who have Jesus on trial here 
can attest to this by, by bringing the scriptures to, to the forefront by saying, your law in Deuteronomy 17 and 19 ask for multiple witnesses to a given act or to a given truth. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6, on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. In chapter 19 of Deuteronomy, it says, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. See, the law itself calls for two to three witnesses. And so Jesus here is in compliance with the Old Testament law. It is on the basis of these three witnesses that, like the Jews, here the world will reject. See, Jesus will ultimately be rejected, even with these credible witnesses. Jesus is not saying that his words are false when he says, my testimony alone is not true. He's just clarifying the fact that you can't testify for yourself in the normal court of appeals. You can't go up to the court and to the judge and say, well, I didn't do it. And the judge will ask you, well, why? How, do you, how do we know you didn't do it? Oh, because I said like, that won't fly. You, weren't, you, can, you can't go up to a judge and say, I wasn't speeding. Oh, well, we got you on radar for 95 miles per hour down the 290. Well, no, I wasn't. Well, who, who was with you? Just me, myself, and I. You can't use your own witness to provide your own backup. And although Jesus is the authority, the authority on earth, he will submit once more for the sake of Humanity. That's why Philippians, the, 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 that passage of him humbling himself down like a servant, is on more than just the, the human nature that he takes on. He humbly submits to even human authority once more for the sake of salvation. So first witness up to the stand, first witness up on the courtroom is the father that we read about from the beginning in verses 32 as well as in verses 37 through 38. You could put that in your notes. The first witness is in thir verse 32 and verses 37 through 38. If you read with me in verse 32, Jesus says, There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. This another, in verse 32, is his primary witness, and this is the Father. He's not talking about John the Baptist yet. He's talking about his father. Everything that the son has been saying and doing since the beginning of his ministry is corroborated by the father. He's got his spiritual backup by his father. His words, his actions have been always backed up by his father. So John writes later in his first epistle in 1 John chapter 5, verse 9 through 10, that God's testimony is even greater and far superior than the testimony of any single person. And according to John, this affects a person inwardly. Why is God's testimony so important? Why is God's uh, no, or, or, uh, authority in the testimony that he gives about his son so crucial because it affects a person on the inside. This isn't something to be externally experienced. What God does is change the inward nature of a person by providing them with a faithful witness to the truth. That's why Jesus says what God says about me is true. If you don't believe what God says, you don't believe. You're just lost and hopeless without faith. You need a credible witness like the Father because what he will do will affect the inward person. This great testimony is therefore with the purpose to fight against this notion and this debilitating factor in every human life about sin. God's testimony primarily fights against sinful nature. And friends, you and I know that we are all sinners. We all sin. We all fall short. There is this constant sin problem that we face continuously. How do you get rid of it? 
How do you stop sinning? How is this sin problem cured? Well, because of God's testimony and the way God bears witness to his son, he also protects us from this very dilemma. Now, there is not a perfection aspect here because we're all, even though we are Christian or we call ourselves Christian, we will face temptation. And many of us, including myself, will fall and fail time and time again. But I want you to open up to 1 John, see what he reads in his first epistle, what he says in his first epistle. John reminds us what it means to fight this battle of sin. In 1 John chapter 5, read with me verses 18 and on. He says, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in the Son of Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. So the the fact of the matter is we are all going to sin. And because we are born of God, we're not going to enjoy it. That's what he means when he says we stop sinning. We won't enjoy our sinful nature like many of us have been accustomed to doing. That's a warning sign for your Christian walk. If you're continuously doing and falling in the same sin and enjoying it, you got to ask yourself, are you of God? The fact of the matter is, God's testimony helps you fight against sin. That's why John says, he who overcame the world. And then he says in verse 19 that the evil one has the world in its power, in its hand. And the only way we can combat is by the testimony of faith in God through Jesus Christ. That's why in 1 John chapter 5, earlier on in verse 4, he says, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. What? Our faith. John calls our attention to the faith that we have in God has this, gives us this wonderful victory over sin. Where we're not constantly indebted or enchained to sinful nature. It falls by the authority of our faith. Though we will struggle, we will overcome Friends, I've had countless people come to counseling. We've met countless amounts of people in our 30 years or almost 30 years of existence as a church where we have had people here who have been addicted to pornography, addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs, wanted to commit suicide. That was always a problem and and it has always been a problem in human nature. But by the help of God, not by anything I could do, I can't change anyone's character. I can't change anyone's attitude or the way they do things. The power of God in their lives, we've seen people leave and flee from alcoholism, flee from pornography, flee from all of these chains that have bound them, and many of them are right here, right now, because of our faith. That is why the testimony of the Father is so important. Because he's not just pointing in the direction of someone. He is pointing inwardly to each and every single person's heart. To convict them, first and foremost, of their sin. The sin problem in a person's life is not overcome with an ascetic lifestyle. As one trying to become a Christian masochist. It isn't the good works you do for the needy during Thanksgiving or Christmas or even during this pandemic. It is your faith in the Son of God who will heal your heart and your disease. That's the issue. Many times many people just want to spiritually hurt themselves or, 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 or submit themselves to an austere lifestyle in order to please God. 
That's not the way we do it. That's not the way God designed it. He speaks to our heart and convicts us of our sin. So therefore, we should stop trying to cover up our lack of faith and our desire and our love for sin with external fluff. It's an inward working that one needs to receive in order to believe and in order to be freed from their slavery of sin. So this obvious testimony or, or this obvious uh, person on the stand, this obvious witness will be rejected. Why will he be rejected? Why is God in the eyes of the Jewish people not a credible witness? Well, two main reasons. His opponents would reject this witness for the obvious reason that Jesus presents is the fact that no one can see him or no one can hear him. In the essence, for the Jews, Jesus is calling a witness that no one can hear or see. But Jesus himself made this clear as he mentioned in John chapter 1. That no one has seen God but the Son. God is beyond all human comprehension or physical sensing. That is why they always asked for signs when Jesus would claim his authority. But Jesus kept pointing them to the Father and that the Father gave him the authority over the world. Because he, as he mentioned in John chapter 1, was God and is God. God. No need for a sign. No need for miraculous events, although he did. No need for, for, for an exhibition of mighty power, although he did and will do, as we will read later on in the gospel. He himself is God. Opponents always want an external view because external views and external, uh, the external can really be appealing to a person. What you see is often more appealing than what you feel or what you know inside. You can see a person on the outside, well-dressed, look like he has everything figured out, drives a Tesla, has a good job, can work from home, has, this, has a good bank account. Everything figured out and everything looks good externally, but we don't know what's going on on the inside. So that is why this testimony will first and foremost be rejected because no one can see God and therefore no one can point to the sin that's within them. What the Jews are often rejecting here is this notion that they themselves are dirty, that they themselves are sinful because they're Jewish people. They wash themselves continuously to show how pure they are. But Jesus will later point out that that's just external works. So once again, this, this testimony of an internal witness isn't for the purposes of external washing. It's internal washing that God is doing in every single person. And so Jesus understands this and so stresses on the second reason why people reject God's word. God is because he cannot be heard. But that's interesting because God's word, although it cannot be heard... It is seen in God's incarnate word, which is Jesus Christ. That's why we spent so much time on John chapter 1 talking about the logos, which, mean, which is the Greek word for word. He is the word of God. He is the evidence of God on earth. And though they can't hear God, they can hear Christ because he speaks and he also speaks God's word from the Old Testament. We'll get more on, on that factor when we get into the fourth witness, which is scriptures. But this is what they reject. Because though they can read God's word, they don't accept God's word in inwardly. There is a constant rejection to God's word. And that's why the prophets themselves would say, you guys don't understand we're not looking for an external show. It is obedience and submission that God is looking for. And so this was, 
this physical representation of God was rejected because it called them to witness and it called them to repentance. Something that they would not be willing to do because they thought they can do it themselves through external ceremonies. So this was not enough. And it was absent from them because they had not his word and so therefore they would not believe. So that was witness number one. Credible witness number two, we'll find in verses 33 through 35. So I want to set that up by reading it for you. Here's witness number two. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp. And you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. So this credible witness that comes to testify about Jesus is John the Baptist. Which we can use and have an example of what it means to be a human witness. None of us here are God. We, can't ha- we don't have the power that God has to witness. But we do have our human quality. We are human beings. And therefore, what Jesus is doing is calling a human witness to the stand because God they cannot see, God they cannot hear, but they can see John and they can hear John. And John was well known. Within these verses, Jesus says that John's testimony is true. That says something. For Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God, to say that what you say is true, that's a credible testimony. That which is recorded in John, in John chapter 1, verses 29, when, when, we, when we hear John for the first time see Jesus and say, the Lamb of God. Jesus also calls him a burning and shining lamp. What we have here is a human witness to Jesus, his person and ministry. So John the Baptist's witness ought to weigh on our minds today. And here's the charge for the church. No doubt the clear memory of John's recent ministry made this a powerful witness in Jesus' time. But we too, as a church, Vida Mundante, must reckon with the reality that before the coming of Jesus, a prophet A prophetic figure arose in Israel like no other for 400 years. And this witness identified Jesus as the Messiah. That's weighty. That has weight for someone to come out of a 400-year period of silence to point to the Son of Man and recognize him as the Messiah bears weight. So John's ministry was public, and what he testified to was the truth, as verse 33 says. Though the testimony of his father should be enough because God is God, Jesus pointed to John for the sake of who? People that heard him. For the sake of his hearers. So they can believe. See, the purpose of of the witnesses and the purpose of Jesus using these witnesses was ultimately for salvation. It was another opportunity for people to be saved. See, what, what, what we have to understand in the way of this charge for the church is that salvation and life is at stake. We're not talking about disease or infirmity or, 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 or anything that's going on in a pandemic scenario. I'm talking about spiritual death and spiritual life. That's what's at stake here. And so for the reason that John comes into the picture is to provide salvation. To give another opportunity for people to come to saving faith in the Son of Man. So John comes up, and although the authority of Christ does not rest on simply or merely a human recognition, because we know that salvation comes from God and God alone, this was another opportunity for them to be saved. Read that again in verse 34. The end of verse 34. But I say these things so that you may be saved. That's 
what witnesses do. Witnesses to Christ. Carry the purpose to save those who are in sin. And sometimes Christians are annoying because they just want to argue their point. Sometimes Christians just want to debate all the time. and Sit across the room with an atheist and just be like, well, you're dumb because you don't believe in God. And, you know, and, and they just want to debate. They just want to fight all the time. That's not the point of witness. You're supposed to sit in front of your friend at work and say, friend, you're a sinner. And God came to save sinners. And your friend must be like, what? Me? I'm not that bad. Or your friend will kind of look at you and be like, bro, you're worse than I am. <laughs> you, you, you like, you've been sleeping around. Like, what, what are you talking about? You know, so you got to watch out with your credibility too, which we'll get to at the end. But I'm, I'm speaking on salvation. It isn't an appeal to, to some type of religion. Come and feel this wonderful atmosphere that we provide. We're not begging people to come to church so, so that they can enjoy the vibes. It's because the people there are cool. It's because there's a lot of single chicks. There's a lot of single guys that you might be able to hook yourself up with, you know, they're, and they're Christian. It, it's not for the presentation of something that we offer. We have, friends, we have nothing to offer you. Like, you want to listen to good music, go to a concert, you know, and, 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 and listen to professional musicians. You know, our musicians do the best they can, but they're not professional musicians. You, you, want, you want to hear a, a wonderful orator speak and give eloquence and, and speak with some fancy words and listen to some TED Talks. Like, there's better things out there that you can fill your mind and soul and be happy with. We got nothing to offer you guys. The only thing that we have to offer is salvation. Come to Christ because you're a sinner that needs salvation. That's what we're here to do. And that's what you're supposed to be doing at your work. That's what you're supposed to be doing at your, in your family. That's what you're supposed to be doing with your kids. Gotta, they got to understand what it means to, to be a sinner before God. But that God has provided a way of salvation for them and for us. This is the integrity of John. When John is called as a witness, he is called as a witness because of his integrity, because of who he is. People will hear the message and they will evaluate the person who is giving that message, which is interesting in and of itself. And I'll say why in a bit. In verse 35, Jesus says he is a burning and shining lamp. It is helpful to know that the word burning in the Greek is kemenos, which is a passive participle, which means it can be translated instead of burning, it can also be translated to kindled. The fact that he is burning is because he was ignited. He was set on fire by an external source. It's derivative. He is a person who was set on fire by an external source. And that's why the second participle we see in the clause is a present active participle, which means he is shining. The reason why he's shining is because he didn't set himself on fire. We're not talking literally here. This is the words of Jesus saying that he's a burning lamp. He didn't set himself on fire, and therefore he is set on fire by God, which causes him to shine continuously. It isn't a made-up or a self-provided fire. It is God-ordained and God-given. John's light was der derivative and it was based on God as his source. It had to be ignited. Still, the witness to Jesus must shine and provide light, not to themselves. That's why John is never called the false in Greek. Jesus is called phos, which means the true light. John is called luknos, lamp, who is shedding light, God's light over the world. So Jesus' words are a challenge to Christian witness, to our job roles and responsibilities. Jesus calls John a lamp. He was willing to, set, to be set on fire for the sake of Christ. Candle not only burns, but offers itself to be consumed for the purpose of producing fire and light. Remember the 
great American missionary and martyr of the 20th century, Jim Elliott, he said this, and I quote, God, I pray thee, light these idle sticks of my life and and may I burn up for thee. Consume my life, my God, for it is thine. And then later he writes in his journal and he questions himself. And I quote, am I ignitable? God, deliver me from the dread asbestos of other things. Saturate me with the oil of the Spirit that, my, that I may be aflame. End quote. So the question here for all of us as a Christian witness should be, am I ignitable? As Elliot has questioned himself. Can I burn for the cause of Christ? And may God deliver us from the worldly things that dim our light and dampen our flame. Sometimes the status of the church is the way it is because our lights are dampened and not aflamed for God. Everyone was attracted to the, 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 the ministry of John, which is interesting. Religious leaders were attracted to his ministry. Tons of people would come to get baptized by John as the Gospels teach us in Matthew chapter 3. And, 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 and the leaders would, themselves would come. And John was not preaching some soft message. Luke says that he was preaching a message of repentance and forgiveness of sins. Matthew describes John as being this weird person clothed in camel's hair and ate bugs and honey for breakfast. This was a weird person, a weird individual that carried a weird message. Something culturally not acceptable in John's time, nor in our time. Everyone accepts people based off their Instagram feed and what they wear and what they use and what they do and their lifestyle. John himself was no physical representation of anything good. He didn't have the clothes. He didn't have the look. He didn't have the lifestyle. But he had the message. And the message was repentance of sin and forgiveness of sin. So we'll pick up John's life next week so you could understand his credibility as a testimony. But I want to remind you of this simple fact. John burned for Christ because he understood his purpose. And church, we won't do our jobs well if we don't understand our purpose. There's people out there that are dying physically without Christ and, dying and are dead spiritually without Christ. They need to hear the message of salvation. Stand up this morning with us. The pastor will come and bless us.